What are we starting with this week? A we comment. Spotify update. A we comment. No, we did that last week. Luke, what did you say? A Spotify update. No. This a time, we email. No, we, no, we, we don't do emails. We don't stream. do emails. A review. Um, a we an review. Apple podcast review. Well done, Jamp. You're absolutely correct. We are doing an Apple podcast review. Thank so you. So this one is from Sarah Jane Jake. It's a five-star review. It says, I love this podcast so much, still working on watching all of the past episodes. It's fun to listen to and makes me sound so much smarter. Isn't that nice? That is lovely. That's very nice. That's lovely. Thank you. So if you want to look smart in front of your friends, listen to Sci Guys. That sounds show. like good do advice do 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 to do. me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start the show. Let's start the show. Wait, do we have a question? Oh. What is your favorite cryptid? That's the question for this week. Get down in the comments, ask that, answer that question. What's your favorite cryptid? I don't know what Let's that means. Let's start the show. I don't know what that means either. Let's well, start the show. Because... Hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jemp and Luke Cutforth. Uh, hello. Why, hello there. This week, we're talking about the Loch Ness Monster. Oh! Very good. Yeah. Good old Nessie. Is it real? Well, maybe. That's what we're finding out today. Oh. Because I've got a little science report on the Loch Ness Monster and uh, and uh, whether or not she is real. A yes or a no would be too quick an episode, Luke. Yeah. Yeah. Is, a, is the Loch Ness Monster a, a she? Yeah, Nessie. Nessie. Yeah. She's always called a girl. Vanessa. Right? No. No, Call me Vanessa. progressive, but I consider Nessie a gender-neutral name. It's not very progressive to misgender the Loch Ness Monster, Luke. <laughs> oh, no! I'm cancelled! Yeah. So, Loch Ness is a lake. It's in the Highlands. You know that? Yeah? You know all this? I didn't. Yeah, it's, one of the biggest, yeah, it's one of the biggest in the UK. It is uh, 240 meters deep and about 36 kilometers long. And it's got the most fresh water of any lake in Britain. The most fresh? The the, the largest volume of fresh water. Oh, so no Which mess. is surprising, as Nessie's been pissing in it for centuries. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Nessie gets out, pisses in another <laughs> lake, and then gets back into that one. No, um, it's got over 7 billion cubic meters of water. So there's a lot of water in there, which is why we might not have found the Loch Ness Monster quite yet. It's too much so, to go through. Do you guys know where the Loch Ness Monster comes from? Don't say Loch Ness. Scotland. Legend. Myth. You know what? I realize I put the bar way too low for that one. <laughs> uh, no, so <laughs> the Loch Ness Monster Myth. Her mother. Ooh. The Loch Ness Monster Myth. The Loch Ness Mother. <laughs> <laughs> so the myth first came about in the 6th century. Um, apparently it was an Irish monk called Columba who became a Catholic saint, um, was supposed to have stopped Nessie um, as she was attacking a swimmer. Um, and basically this this saint just chased the Loch Ness, Loch Ness monster away. I do love saints in stories, though, because saints are always doing stuff like that, you know? What was Chasing the Irish away monk monsters. doing in Scotland? I, I don't know. They're close. Is, Holiday. Is, <laughs> is this why this person is a saint? No. No, I don't okay. think so. Okay. So I mean, this is a real saint. This is a patron saint of the Catholic Church. Uh, yeah, it seems so. Columba, Catholic saint. But bear and in mind, and it's based on a story that's not. Well, pardon me if we find out the Loch Ness <laughs> monster is true, but not true. <laughs> Sorry, Luke. Hold on. Um, <laughs> can I just can I just double check what you're saying there? Are you, are you surprised that a story about a Catholic saint isn't true? Well, Cory, uh, I don't know <laughs> what you are trying to today. suggest here. <laughs> But I, what I mean is, I'm surprised that there is a story of this Catholic saint that is so... Now again, pardon me if we find out something about the Loch Ness Monster in this story. Demonstrably false. Isn't it? Isn't it? Who's the... Who's it's the like there being a saint that was like met with dinosaurs or something. You know. Who's the patron saint of Wales? I don't know. I don't know. Prince William. I don't know Wales had a Patreon. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> is it so, Ashley Muller? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been too easy. Yeah, my apologies. <laughs> saints are known for saints are known for like slaying dragons and whatnot. And oh, getting the snakes out of oh. different. Yeah. I well, the Catholic just, like, Church has some answering people. to do, then, doesn't it? 
Saint Nicholas is supposed to have given gifts to all the kill- all the children in the world. No, Saint Nicholas has really did that. He he gave of gifts all the to like the, the local world. area. Yeah, and now Santa Claus gives gifts to everyone in the world. I'm just saying that there is there is an element of myth with with all saints. Absurdity. This is, this is par for the course. Um, and also, look, I'm gonna put it out there. I don't think everything the Bible says Jesus did is a hundred percent true. I'm putting that out there. I'm going out on a limb. Maybe the Bible has some things that are important. He definitely walked on water, though, didn't he? Sure. Yeah. Okay. He walked Can't on take some that ice. from us. He walked on some ice. Oh, That's what he did. That was it. Yeah. Like penguins. <laughs> yes, Jesus was a penguin. He Good gave 5,000 people a crumb of bread. <laughs> 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 I didn't say how much bread I gave them. <laughs> I just shared yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't say how full they were. Yeah. I think it actually They I think all it still actually starved does. to death. They'd all I think, actually no, I think eaten. it does say they are all quite full, actually. At the That's because oh. they'd all eaten before they came. You know, they'd all had they'd all had a very <laughs> large lunch. They'd all filled up on bread. <laughs> well, Jesus was like, no, no, here's the bread. And they were like, no, thank you. I've already had plenty of bread today. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a crumb. Stomach. I'll take a crumb. Yeah. <laughs> they were all pescatarians as well, which is why the fish managed to go around everyone. <laughs> because they all just gave it a little kiss and passed they it were, on. Just, oh, no, not for me. Thank you. No, no thanks. No, yeah. No. So the Loch Ness monster uh, first uh, came about in a, a legend from the sixth century, which is older than America. Just want just want to put that out there. Um, wow! And the legend apparently America. stuck around. Well, obviously older than Captain America. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you said? No, I just said take that America. <laughs> oh. But sh- sure, I'm and sure Captain, Captain America. America. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Actually, I think you'll find Captain America originates from a third century Catholic saint. Before America. <laughs> yes. That's where uh, it got its name. From it ended America American. after him. Right. So this legend Steve. gets Patron Steve Saint America. Steve. <laughs> Steve America. <laughs> so this this legend stuck around for a long time. And apparently in the nineteen thirties there were newspapers reporting on Nessie sightings. Um and you know people people have made money from this there's you know there's the sort of uh there's all these sort of different businesses that have sprung up around nessie you can get nessie merch um oh. in different places in scotland you know all the tourist traps mm-hmm. so it, it i mean and you know people go into loch ness because of the legend of the loch ness monster presumably brings in a fair amount of money uh so nessie sightings um kind of aren't super i mean they're not uncommon but you know they're not they're not happening all the time, uh, but when they do happen, often it turns out to be a hoax or <laughs> a log, or um, mostly those two really hoaxes and logs. That's that's what they mostly turn out to be. Um, although there was a famous photo, you guys have seen that famous photo of Nessie, yeah. right? Yes, yeah? and they built a big like thing, yeah, and put you it know in what, the water. Do you know what that was? The, no, the I can't remember. I don't know. No, so elephant, that's interesting. We'll get to that in a second. But this photo was actually a toy submarine and some wood putty. What? Yeah. <laughs> Someone was very cross because they were made fun of in a newspaper uh, for for saying that there was a Nessie sighting. So they faked a photo um, to stick it to the man. Right, you've proved their submarine. point, haven't you? Yeah, well, there you yeah. go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and no, you say elephant. Elephants were one of the explanations that people had that there could have been traveling circuses, oh. and they let the they let the elephants out to swim in the loch. And is you know what you think is a is a head of a of a monster is actually trunk. a nice little elephant trunk. Yeah, just sticking out like getting, getting some breathing. Yeah, because they they do look kind of like it is like like a Diplodocus kind of look for Nessie, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Generally, love that I look mean, on her. Plesiosaur is the most common sort of. Um, is the most common sort of explanation, uh, dinosaur explanation for Nessie. Ah. Yeah, which, uh, again... Because it's a water dinosaur. Yes, it's a big water dinosaur. As opposed dinosaur. to a Diplodocus, which is not. <laughs> well, Diplodocus, actually, interestingly, those long-necked dinosaurs, there, there are theories that they were semi-aquatic, and so they would walk across the water, they'd have their heads stuck out, and that's, and that's how they managed to maintain their massive ah. size, and it was beneficial. So instead of, like, you know doing it to reach up for trees because apparently they ate lower leaves as well. Um, it was because they, they had their heads at the water. Mm. That's not fact. That's not fact. That's just one idea. By mm. the way. So their neck is just there. a big snorkel. More or less. Yeah. yeah. Your neck is the snorkel tube. Yeah. Uh, just like with snorkels when we cut our heads off and stick them on the top of the snorkel so we can still breathe. <laughs> 
Luke, please don't go snorkeling. <laughs> Just... wow. the last I you. clearly haven't, Corey, because my head is still on my neck. <laughs> it's a once in a lifetime experience, I hate. <laughs> <laughs> it's to die for, really. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that, that photo was published. Um, uh, it turned out being a toy submarine and some putty. Uh, and like I said, there's lots of different explanations. There was the elephants one that I just mentioned. There was the uh, sort of, is it plesiosaur? Did I say plesiosaur? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's one, it's yeah, some kind of dinosaur. Um, and apparently there's another there's another theory that it's branches that have fallen into the loch. Um, lots of different lots of different ideas for this. Um, but we we've started looking, right? We started looking into see whether you know there was any Loch Ness monster, and anything we tried, it, nothing really comes up. You know, we we don't we've used sonar. Apparently, we can't find anything using sonar. Uh, that was in two thousand three. Um, but still, you know, the the legend of Nessie persists, and so I'll I'll go through sort of maybe uh, should I go through a bit of a timeline? I'll go yeah. through a little bit of a timeline. Go on. So as I said, back in nineteen thirty three. Um, there was, uh, there were sort of, you know, people like really caught on with, um, Nessie. That's when this more sort of modern interpretation of Nessie really caught on 1933. Um, and then the, that famous photograph that we spoke about came about in 1934. And then in the sixties, there were, um, videos. Uh, there was like a video, like a, you know, someone caught apparently, uh, you know, um, well, someone caught, yeah, a, a video of Nessie, um, on film. Uh, but it turns out after like sort of looking into this photo that it was just a fishing boat um yeah yeah unfortunately just a fishing boat um and in 1962 to 1972 there was the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau um and they spent 10 years hunting for Nessie 10 years yeah they were putting cameras around the locks uh they were using lights infrared cameras submarines basically everything that they could try um and they they could not find anything. They did they did um, have uh, something come up on sonar that they couldn't explain um, twice uh, in this in 1962 and 1968, but th- no sighting of Nessie really. Um, and then in 1975, um, the Nessie had been in Doctor Who, had been in sort of basically had become popular culture. Right, everybody knew everybody who was anybody yeah. knew about the Loch Ness monster. And then, you know, in the 80s, people continued to sort of look for Nessie. Um, and then in 2003, um, the, like I said, the BBC funded um, a search using sonar beams, found nothing. Um, and then, you know, 2009, uh, she showed up um, on, um, she showed up, uh, she showed up on Google Earth, supposedly. There was like a mysterious sort of image on Google <gasps> Earth. Um, and then in 2016... We used sonar again. We found something quite interesting. We actually found a Loch Ness monster in what? Loch Ness. What? Yeah, it was a prop built for um, a, a Sherlock Holmes film, which had sunk um, 50 years beforehand. So, <laughs> so it wasn't real. No, it wasn't real. Well, it was real, just not alive, alive. or an animal. Or, or a monster. Or a monster. Yeah, or just Nessie. a prop. Um, and then... In 2019, this is what I want to talk about. In 2019, a man named Neil Gemmel, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, went ahead and did this massive survey of the waters of Loch Ness to try and find Nessie, supposedly. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Neil Gemmel's search for the Loch Ness Monster. Because this is something that came up while I was just looking for topics. And apparently, um, you might have heard of this about a year a year or two ago, there were lots of articles going out about people finding out, scientists finding out what the what the Loch Ness Monster could actually be. So, did you guys hear about that at all? No. 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 Essentially, uh, Gemmel is a New Zealand Kiwi, uh, is a Kiwi scientist. Uh, not a scientist for kiwis, the fruit or the bird. He is from New Zealand. Uh, <laughs> need to be clear of that. He's from New Zealand, uh, and and he has done similar sort of studies uh, before. I'll I'll get into that in a in a bit. So essentially, what they did was they went to Loch Ness. That just about two days before they before they got there, there were a few sightings of the Loch Ness monster. So you know you'd expect that if um, if the Loch Ness monster was actually kicking about, that they'd be in a good position to find her, given that mm. she'd been sighted a couple of days before. So, what they did 
they got there in 2018, in June, um, and then took 250 water samples from the surface of the water, from way down deep in the water, um, and that was over a period of two weeks. And then they took that, the DNA that they found in the water, they amplified that, probably using PCR, which we've spoken about before. So they amplified mm. their DNA up, so they've got lots of it to sort of study. And they then basically sequenced the DNA to find out what was in the water. Right, so they were finding out what kind of animals and plants were in, like, sort of in and around Loch Ness, um, and this is so. Gemmel said that uh, the sample showed which animals and plants had interacted with the local environment in the previous twenty-four to forty-eight hours. Right, and mm -hmm. again, given there was a sighting of Nessie not two days before, you expect her to show up. But what did they find? What do you think they found? Lots of fish and lots of plants and nothing else. Not much Nessie. Well. Not nothing else. They found they found more than just fish and plants. Interestingly, oh. yeah. So here's what they found. Right, they didn't oh, find any giant giant reptiles or dinosaurs or anything like that. No, no monsters of that of that kind of of that kind of sort of um, caliber. They did. They, there there were other sort of explanations for Nessie, like giant sturgeons or catfish or even sort of sharks, uh, but. There was not that much. Um, there was not that much DNA from any of those either. Um, there was no shark DNA. There was no sturgeon or catfish DNA, um, based on the samples that they took. Um, and what they did find, though, was a lot of eel DNA. DNA oh. from eels. You know the, the yeah. long sort of like yeah. wiggly fish. When <laughs> you say that there were no large reptiles, yes. Um, do you are you able to tell from DNA what size the thing is that gave the DNA? So no large reptiles in the sense that DNA from a, a reptile species that is no large. known large reptiles. Um, a Komodo dragon, for example, is a large reptile. So no known large reptiles. Yeah, but well, there's what do no you mean DNA. By that? So like there was no DNA for any reptiles that we are aware of that are large. Yes. Yeah. So what if there was an unknown large reptile? Would you be able to tell from the DNA that it was an unknown large reptile? You'd probably be able to tell that it was a reptile from the DNA. Um, but it might be like a little newt or something. Assuming they're net reptiles. They're probably not. They're amphibious. But yeah, they are. Amphibious, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so they're, I think they're amphibians, yeah. So, no, 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 they didn't find any, uh, they didn't find any reptile DNA. Um, they didn't find any reptiles at all. In the water. Okay, okay. In, in the, they, okay. They didn't find any reptile DNA at all in the water. Um... And this is the thing, that, that's an interesting question because that's that's literally what they go on to say, uh, that they didn't find, they, they found a lot of eel DNA and they can't tell the size of the individual animal from the DNA, obviously, yeah. because the DNA Unless is fairly consistent. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but they, they, they know that eels can grow to be quite large. So um, there were there was eel DNA at pretty much every single place that they, that they looked, right? Because they took 250 samples of different parts of Loch Ness and then looked at the DNA in there, and there was eel DNA in most of those 250 samples. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and because there is so much DNA there, there was so much eel DNA, you can't yeah. tell the size of the eel from the DNA, but what, what, he, what he did say was that we can't discount the possibility that there may be giant eels in Loch Ness, <laughs> therefore we can't discount the possibility that what people see and believe is the Loch Ness monster might be a giant eel. Just be now, eels. Yeah, it could just be <laughs> eels, right? Um, but that wasn't, it wasn't just eel DNA that they found. They found DNA from humans, dogs, sheep, cattle, deer, badgers, rabbits, voles, and birds. Now, Could I'll kind of get... big badgers? I don't think it's a big badger. Okay. Bear in mind that the DNA, the, the DNA that they're finding, this is, this is DNA that's kind of shed from an animal, right? So you shed mm. DNA all the time, you know, when yeah. you get your skin, skin cells off and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. You know, you're, you're shedding your DNA. Yeah. A little bit of DNA uh. gone there. So... It's it's not just what's specifically in the water. It's also what's in and around the water. Yeah, yeah. That's why they found all that. Um, so as I said, yeah, they found a lot of eels. They can't tell what size the eels are, but the eels were the sort of the the DNA that they found. The the most um, most of it was eels made up the largest proportion of DNA that they found. Essentially, right. So a lot of the DNA that they found was DNA that they found was eels. There were more eel DNA than there was DNA of any of the other animals. Mm -hmm. Was there any unknown mysterious DNA unknown to science? Not as far as I'm aware. <laughs> Not as far as I'm aware. This is the thing. I wanted. I do want to talk about this because this is this is interesting to me. When I looked into this, I always go ahead and try and find the original study. There were about 
10 articles. I mean, there's tons of articles, but maybe 10 from sources that I would say are somewhat reputable when talking about science. So like, you know, the BBC, uh, Scientific American, all those sort of, all those sort of places where I'll look to see what, to see if they've got anything extra that's been added or anything, any, any interesting take. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I looked at all of those. Live science as well. Not a single one of them linked back to a study because there wasn't, I don't think there is a published study. I went, I went on a search here. I went looking at Neil Gemmell's, um, I went to his website. I went to uh, the list of his publications. I looked through all of them and he publishes a lot of stuff. His name is on a lot of papers. Yeah. Could not find anything. I went to his website, looked at the sort of um, our studies from his lab because his lab were the ones that did this survey. There is not a published paper as far as I can tell on this. So, so this is a press release. Well, there was a documentary about it. Oh, uh, okay. There was a documentary about it. There was a press release. I went through so much, honestly. I went through his Twitter. I went through everything. It's kind of a press release, yeah. Um, in fact, yeah, there was a there was actually a press event, um, I think, prior to the documentary coming out. But um, it was, it, it like yeah. So in, when it comes to sort of the the nitty gritty, I can't actually go in go in and look at the data and answer all of these questions for you. Mm. But I, I I'm basing basically off of what Neil has said himself. And I've gone to his Twitter as well to see some of his explanations for X, Y, Z. Um, and he's, he said, oh, this article is good for X, that article is good for Y, in terms of sort of what, um, what the articles are saying about his work. That's disappointing. <laughs> Come on, Neil, try harder. So, yeah, so again, like, uh, this is the thing. I've actually got, uh, I've got a, a little sort of um, an image here. Uh, that gives some information on this. It's from the University of Otago um, in New Zealand. We were partly, I think this study was carried out for them. It was from Neil's lab, mm -hmm. which I think is in the University of Otago. I'm not entirely sure how it works, but they were involved in some way. So this sort of, um, what's the word for when there's pictures and information and it's, it's in a nice, nice visual format. There's a specific word for it. I an infographic. Remember. An infographic. Yes, that's it. Thank you very much, Luke. So they, there's some information from this. I'll, I'll I'll just I'll just go into it. There's, uh, it's very great. There's a little there's a little drawing of a plesiosaur, a little drawing of a shark, and a little Aww. drawing of a catfish. They're all circled with a line through them. There's no plesiosaur. There's no, no. shark. There's no catfish. Ah, very visual. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the cross makes all the difference. Exactly. Um, but uh, the largest known European eel is six feet long, right? Which is about my height. Think of think of how tall you expect me to be, and yeah. that's how long the eel is, right? Oh, I would not want to meet that eel. No, I no. mean you wouldn't want to meet me either. That is well, no, it's probably worse than meeting remotely. <laughs> 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 but really, an eel my length, so there, and it, it'd be quite quite thick as well. But the sort of estimated size of this Loch Ness eel would be with they've they've estimated to be about twelve feet, which is about oh. twice the length of the the largest known European eel. Now, bear in mind. It is perfectly possible to find to find animals that are larger than what you expect. I mean, think about when we found the colossal squid, or the giant squid, and then the colossal squid sitting at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, you know those. We spoke about that in the in too deep episode. Which number was that, Jamp? Twenty two. Twenty two. I got that right. No, I remember now. Twenty two. Amazing. There you go. I love that skill. So yeah, we spoke about that in our. We spoke, I think we touched on them in our in too deep episode, um, and yeah. The thing is that it could it could just really be a large eel because it kind of kind of, eels kind of match with the description of Nessie. Obviously, the issue here is this eel would have to be bigger than any known eel. Yeah. Um. But then it also says that seals could uh, seals and sturgeons could also account for some of the sightings. It's just that they don't often get to Loch Ness, mm -hmm. so that's 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 why they probably didn't find any DNA but some of the sightings could be seals or sturgeon or, I mean, anything anything sort of like that. Because they, I mean, there, there's lots of stuff going in and out of Loch Ness. It's a massive, massive loch. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so they, they're not really sure. Uh, they're not really, they don't really have a definitive answer for what the Loch Ness monster is. I mean, maybe it's an eel. Maybe people are just making it up. But um, do you not think it... I don't know why, but it's so disappointing if it turned out it was an eel. Really? Something just so disappointing about it doesn't even have any legs uh it's just like wriggling around loch ness and we've built an, like an entire industry and tourism out of this it's just like a big eel i think it's a less disappointing than it being eel. nothing i think a giant 12 foot eel is pretty cool that is, that's pretty exciting 
Because it'd have to be pretty thick. The biggest deal ever. Like, that'd be about the size of this. I mean, just two just curries. A bit smaller than this room that I'm in. And I wouldn't want to make two curries. No. No. Oh, could you imagine? One on top of the other. <laughs> Regular <laughs> round. <laughs> slimy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They'd be thick as well, right? For for an eel 12 feet long, it'd be very, yeah. like, very girthy. Yeah. Okay, you're convincing me. I'm excited <laughs> now. Thank Honestly, you for selling the large wriggly eel to me. <laughs> I think any I think any explanation for the Loch Ness monster would be fun and interesting, to be totally honest, you know? Because it's it, because it's it's this case of there's this myth and we find the true reason for it. And often we we think that, oh well, uh the, the real reason for things is boring. Outside of fan fantasy, life is boring. But life is really interesting. I think it'd be really cool that there's this, if there was this giant eel that was living in Loch Ness, that people have built this whole myth around because no one's seen an eel that big. Bear in mind, we're not saying that that is, that is what it is. In fact, I really need to caveat this with, no one has said that it is a giant eel. They just said that there's a lot of eel DNA and if an eel could get to be that big, it then could be. there is yeah it could be that that's what people are seeing but it's not a case of that this is what it is this is the most likely thing it's just the least unlikely thing beyond I think people are mostly just seeing seeing logs and and other things and making it up yeah yeah i just think it's because every popular conception of the loch ness monster has been like a large kind of shape moving through like ominously through the water. Mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like eels probably reel pretty quickly. Um, that's a very different sort of um, conception of the Loch Ness Monster um, to the one that I believe I've been sold at least. And I went to Loch Ness and I have done all the tourist stuff in my childhood. Um, and it's definitely always been like a kind of, like I say, a, in, my, in my mind anyway, in my experience, it's always been like, um, you know, that kind of like plesiosaur type. The thin neck long, and head. Long neck that pokes out the yeah. water with a little head on the end. Big body with some fins. But has anyone ever actually seen some fins or have they just assumed that? Do you know what I mean? They've assumed and the fins, I think. The myth, yeah. Has the myth sort of built, is the myth affected what people are seeing? You know? It's and true. Also, with an, you say that an eel would wriggle quite quickly, but I think a six foot eel wouldn't be wriggling that fast. A 12 foot eel. That's true. And if, it is, yeah. if it's a 12 foot eel, then, yeah. which again, twice the size of any known eel, then I, uh, yeah, you know, but that's not really, that's not really the point. What do you guys think about this? I, I do want to talk about this because, uh, these are, these are, this is, this is received funding, not government funding, but I think a lot of people, um, sort of donated money to this, um, sort of privately. What do you guys think about spending this kind of money on, on this kind of science? <laughs> well, I do find it odd when you say the BBC funded a sonar thing. <laughs> um, I'm assuming for a, for a documentary of some sort, which obviously would do very well. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, it is... I mean, I... Look, not to completely rule it out, but I'm pretty sure this is just some... Basically some crap to increase tourism um, and a fun story <sighs> to tell your children to scare them. Oof. Yeah. Oof. Sorry, Scotland. I do love you, but I don't... I don't know. I don't. I don't think. I feel like we would have found it by now. Well, this is the thing, though. This this study was done by well, basically New Zealand, the University of Otago. So there is a reason behind it. It is a little bit more than just tourism. Although I might have misled you a little bit. I was I was letting you buy into the the story of the Loch Ness monster a little more than maybe I should have. So, <laughs> you what, how do you, right? By the way, I'd just like to tell you that I did Google six foot eel and I am now thoroughly terrified of big eels. This is horrible. <laughs> Let me do that. It's horrible. No, I'm just oh, looking at this horrible video. It's, don't it's Google. Just, it looks like a catfish, but it's then Ew. like six foot long. Yeah, don't look at them. People have said. Uh, it just I've, looked at me. I read stories of people that had, uh, <gasps> looked at, like, had like, you know, been out in those waters and seen giant eels um, and, and, and stuff like that. And honestly, it's just. Ooh. Oh, this is horrible. Oh, I've just developed Sorry, a phobia, just Corey. <laughs> I always imagine an eel to be like, um, almost like a tadpole, that kind of like slimy yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. Um, oh. But it's like, it's like a, it's like an animal. It's like, it's got like, you know, thick skin. It's not just a kind of goopy jelly that wriggles around. Yeah, I picture, I picture eels as being maybe this long, maybe just over a foot long, like little skinny wriggly boys, right? But no, yeah. eels can be, like you say, 
big and their Junkie jaws boys. as yeah. well like a mori eel you do not want to be you do not want to be grabbed by one of them um yeah like eels are bloody ugh, horrifying little things especially when they're they're massive but i did i did mislead you a little bit with this episode right i did mislead you with the reason for this so does anything strike you about how they were looking for sort of examples of animals well, they're assuming that the Loch Ness monster is not is DNA based life form, and not Fatal a flaw. alien come to from space and living in the Loch Ness. Is that not the answer you wanted to hear, Corey? You're looking somewhat Fatal error. Uh, disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, no, it's not the answer that I that I wanted <laughs> to hear. <laughs> I thought that's exactly what you wanted to hear. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that is a flaw in the study of how they look for animals. They looked for DNA, and that, that's an assumption they've made that the Loch Ness monster will will have DNA. That is an assumption. That's the question you asked. That's I don't not know what... okay. Maybe I asked my question poorly because that was not at all what I meant. Um, <laughs> so, more what I'm talking about is that you're you. I mean, they were using DNA to look for the Loch Ness Monster, right? They were using DNA to sort of figure out what animals were present there. And I think what's interesting about that is that they were using environmental DNA. So they weren't going and sampling all of the animals in, in, the, in the loch or the animals and plants in the loch. They were taking the water and sampling the DNA from that. Mm -hmm. Now, you might not know, that is actually a really interesting thing to do, right? Um... So it's it's not been around the the idea of environmental DNA or eDNA as I'll start as I'll start calling it now. Um, it's not incredibly old. It's it's a little bit more recent. Obviously, our ability to sequence DNA and amplify DNA has really come is relatively recent uh, recent in human history. You know, it's it's become a lot easier yeah. um, in the past sort of few decades and. That means that now what we can do is essentially instead of having to instead of having to you know look at animals um, directly, we can look for the evidence of them that they leave when they sort of you know leave their DNA mm -hmm. behind. So you don't need to be looking for animals specifically. You can just sample if they're in water. You can just sample where they are, and that's a lot of what um, Gemmell's lab does, right? If you look at a lot of his papers, a lot of them are about eDNA and um, the sort of looking at population based on there was actually a particular one that's looking at populations of environments using eDNA which is really interesting right because i mean from this one we've seen that they've they've extrapolated that there are lots of eels or large a, like a large a, a, a number of large eels in loch ness given that there are there was a lot of eel dna found right so instead of having to like actually count the number of eels or do any sort of direct method, you can just take samples from lots of different places in the lake, which is honestly really cool. It is really cool that you can do that. But it's it doesn't tell you anything about the number of animals because it could be like, if it's mostly eels, it could be thousands of eels, little eels, or it could be one just like... 50 foot eel that's just shedding all sorts of <laughs> DNA all over the place. Well then what you could, if you really want to do that then what you could do is just take the take the DNA samples that you've got and compare them to each other. So if you clone them, breed them. Sure. You could do that also. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean you could oh, okay. you compare mean the like DNA the because same each DNA exactly will be yeah. from one animal. Okay, right, good. Yeah. yeah you're you could right. see how many yeah. You know, you could see, or you, and you could look at the bio, you could look at the diversity of the, the genetic diversity of those animals as well. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah. So the whole well, point of lots of little eels all sticking together, like, a, <laughs> like, um, like nanobots and acting like one giant eel. Look, I, that is literally a Pokemon. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> You've 100% just reinvented that's a Pokemon. That's a monster. That's what it is. <laughs> the wishy washy. Onyx. Oh, wait, oh, not Onyx. God. Not onyx. No, onyx is made of just rocks. Yeah, that's what I thought you meant. Well, I don't no, know. no, no, no. I don't know about then. There is a Pokemon from Sun and Moon called Wishy Washy, Wishy -washy. which has a, it's got an it's got an ability uh, which I think after level twenty two, if its HP decreases to half, I believe this is all from memory, um, it will enter its schooling form, um, which is basically a giant fish made up of lots of different little fish. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like thousand ants from Rick wow. and Morty. Yes, yes, I love that character. I actually did some maths on it to see if one million ants could fill up that ants, volume. Yes. Um, 
I can't remember what the answer was. I don't think it. I don't think it matches up. I think it's just really? a cool number. What? I did the math. I was. I was. It's hard to. Do you know what's really hard? It's hard to find what the volume of an ant is. Okay. Try and find the volume of an ant online. It is not easy. Okay. <laughs> it is. We should take one and then hollow it out and then fill it up. And we can test. Sorry, I literally, I googled volume of one ant, and it says an average worker ant it weighs between one and five milligrams. Its volume is ten m- millimeters cubed. Literally, what kind of go- ant is top that? of Google. What kind of ant is that? Maybe it's the volume of a person. Oh, hold on. No, there was some difficulty in finding this out. <laughs> what, hold on. Well, someone's done the math. What volume would one million ants occupy, and would it be comparable to the volume occupied by a human? Is this you posting, Corey, on Reddit? Hey, no. Okay, look. Probably that Reddit post was not there when I first did it. <laughs> like, it was in 2017. Fair. Yeah, I probably did it when the episode came out. Uh, okay. Yeah, bang on when it came out. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. All I know is that I tried to figure it out myself and I can't remember the answer. I don't think one million ants fits into one. Uh, I don't think one million ants according, is comparable to one person. According to this Reddit, it depends on the ant and the human. Yeah, obviously. Very unhelpful answer. <laughs> God, I love one million ants. What a great character. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> How did he have sex? Never mind. Um, each each ant has sex separately, and then all their babies form a new one million ant. But only the queen could give birth to the. Oh, I don't know anything about the mating patterns of ants, Corey. You can answer this one for yourself. <laughs> 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 with most in with most insects like that. Um, oh, I can't remember the name for it, but um, it's like it's similar to actually. I think uh, naked mole rats do a similar thing, um, wherein there is like sort of one queen that basically all lays all of the eggs or has all of the offspring but there's that that happens with a lot of insects i can't quite remember the name for that um sort of pattern of behavior or biology but um back to the loch ness monster yeah shall we Go jump on, back to that yes so have you figured out why they might have done this study to find out if the loch ness monster is no real. okay right let me get back <laughs> i mean that's what i was thinking <laughs> let me let me do a recap right and we'll and we'll see so okay right <laughs> neil gavel his his um his sort of research team his lab does a lot of work with eDNA and in this yeah. study they were looking for the Loch Ness monster which they knew they probably weren't going to find using eDNA techniques were they pub- were they promoting eDNA here's a quote and from their company <laughs> here's a well not their company so much as just the techniques right so here's a scientists quote scientists are so cool they <laughs> literally are just te- i just i had this cool thing you guys should also do it i'm going to spend a lot of time promoting it even though it doesn't necessarily get me anything yeah cool. good work right good work here is a quote from um here's a quote from gabble he said environmental dna is a very powerful and surprisingly elegant way to understand our rich world um and then he went on to say uh oh what is it if you like this has been a great big science con we've been talking about the science the entire time and we're using the monsters as bait oh essentially ah right it's pretty cool that's very good right i really that's why like i started looking into this story i was like oh loch ness monster eel let's see what it is it'll be something silly and it turned out to be something really interesting it's using it was using environmental dna um and basically showcasing the 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 wonders of this sort of technology this um method of looking um at um at like sort of populations and then the sort of landscape um and just use the loch ness monster as a big old advertising tool for it yeah so Fantastic. what you're saying is that people use discussion of the Loch Ness Monster to promote their own thing, which is why you can go to patreon.com forward slash psyguys to support this show. Patreon.com forward slash psyguys. It was all ruse. We just wanted to promote the show. Very good. And if you pay enough at patreon.com forward slash psyguys, we will have our own hunt for the Loch Ness Monster. We'll do it. We'll go up there. Yeah, we will. We'll definitely I'll go to the Loch Ness. I'll put my camera in my waterproof camera bag. I'll get a wetsuit on and I'll go for a swim with the giant terrifying eels. <laughs> and then we'll have to find a new host of the podcast after Luke is eaten by a giant eel. I, I already Googled do eels eat humans and apparently they don't. So okay. Good. Well, so long as you don't go snorkeling doing it, that, that, would, be, that would be really, really terrible. Well, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Just go scuba diving, please. I think so. So. I need mm. to keep my head. I'm just going to read out some more quotes from Neil Gamble because there's a, he, he's got some good quotes here and these you'll find these are all the sort of articles that I put in the put in the description. Again, it was really frustrating for me actually that I couldn't find um 
the sort of the the source material for this. It was just it's a very frustrating thing that I had to take this from his interviews and articles and whatnot. But he did have a lot of great quotes, as I said. So he went in and he went on and said, I came into this with a view that there probably wasn't a monster. I wanted to understand the biodiversity of Loch Ness, and we've done that very well. So that was really the goal. I, I mean guess. it was just to look at yeah, it was just to do a study of Loch Ness and in doing that, he managed to just hop onto the Loch Ness monster and use that, which I think is fantastic. And honestly, it sucks that science in in our world right now has to be profitable or marketable in some way to be, you know, to be basically funded. Mm -hmm. But it is wonderful to see someone do that so well, you know? And it is very useful for shows like this. I mean, you know, I love it when you've got a great story around something that is just... I mean, this. I, I think this whole story is just really indicative um, of what this podcast is as well. Yeah. You know, it's basically using uh, a really catchy, interesting sort of hook to... To get people interested. Yeah, to, to get people interested, just to talk about something that is just some science, just some interesting science. And slipping in the actual interesting science in there. Yeah. The real stuff. You know, you think you're having fun, you think you're enjoying yourself, but actually you're learning. But, oh we my God, you learned. You. We're putting information in your brain, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, Corey, what do you think? Do you think that the, the Loch Ness Monster is real? Luke, Being a Scottish person of the podcast. Look, I am a man of science, and... While I believe that the Loch Ness Monster probably isn't real, I also want to believe that the Loch Ness Monster is real, so I hold both of those ideas in my head simultaneously. The Loch Ness Monster that is also sounds real. Sounds like probably what most people who believe in the Loch Ness Monster actually do. Yeah, the Loch Ness <laughs> Double think, Cory. Yeah, double yeah. think. Who, who doesn't love a little bit of double think? You know? Well, I love it. Yeah. Look, the Loch Ness Monster is probably not real, but also, she totally is. No, I, I just, I, I very much... This is the thing. I'm very into lore, you know. I'm very, I'm very much into <laughs> that sort of stuff. Scotland and, and, lore. <laughs> I'm into lore and mythology and things. So I do really enjoy the idea of this sort of mythology. I'm really into cryptids. I'm really into uh, these sort of creatures that you know are sort of from mythology and from folklore and probably aren't real, but we we love to keep that sort of idea alive, like Bigfoot, Sasquatch, you know that kind of idea, or um, a Jersey Devil, or Chupacabra, or Yetis. Categorically, probably not real. But really interesting to, to, to one, come up with explanations how they could be real, and two, just to just have fun talking about the sort of mythology around them, you know? So whether or not they're real, I still think they're fun. What do you guys think? I think the Loch Ness Monster is real. <laughs> not physically, but in our hearts. Ah, I just wish we got the Santa Claus argument. It. In our hearts. <laughs> the Loch Ness Monster is a piece of software running on all of our brains. <laughs> that is literally it. Just like Santa Claus. You tell yeah, children what, it's real. What have you got to say? What do you think about the Loch Ness Monster? Um, I just wish we got to the bottom of it. We, because I mean, if you want I just to don't like not knowing. And we can't people, prove non-existence. Yeah. Here's the thing. These kinds of stories are always going to live. Because, like you said, Champ, you can't prove non-existence. Until you find a Sasquatch... People are not going to stop talking about Sasquatch. Exactly. You know, exactly. You, you can't say you cannot you cannot say to someone that fully believes that Bigfoot exists or that Yetis exist or that the Loch Ness monster exists or that El Chupacabra exists. You can't say to them, "Well, we that they don't exist," because what they're looking for you to do is to prove categorically that they don't. Mm -hmm. And unless we take a giant net with tiny little holes and just drag it through Loch Ness, or completely empty it Just with drinking it, yeah. straws, drain it, drain it all out, and then go hunting around the, the bottom. We're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to prove it. And it's even not, then, not if done. we were to do that, they would still say, well, she knew and uh, she got away. She got out. She, she got went out. for She's a wee in the ocean. nearby loch. <laughs> she came <laughs> exactly. back and she was confused why it was all drained. Yeah. <laughs> she filled it up again with her pee. And <laughs> I would what love, she does. I would love for her to exist, but I'd rather know about it, or know why the or how the myth started you know why the myth started oh we know why the i'd myth love started. to know oh because of this uh, patron saint yeah uh, saint sorry i'd love to know what the psychological quirk is that you're describing there cory about how we have a belief and and um we require evidence that the belief is untrue mm. even though that is you know you can't prove a uh, negative um or what is the what's the scientific phrase for that no, you. I mean, um, you can't prove a negative. Is is fair? Okay. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, I'd love to know what the psychological trait behind that is. Uh, obviously, there's the 
financial economic incentive to perpetuate the myth and that obviously keeps it going but there are other myths that don't have quite so much of a economic incentive incentive and, and I'm sure there are other people like, for example, you don't have any economic incentive to perpetuate the myth of um, Nessie not being in the tourist trade around uh, Loch Ness. And so what is it about our minds and the way we've evolved that mean that we gravitate towards, oh, but what if it is true? What I, if? I think it we could just be. like mythology and stories, right? But I think why? That, I think, because like I think a, it's a computer fun. wouldn't love mythology and stories. So what is it? Is it because it's fun? I think it's fun. But I why think... is it fun? What's the psychological thing going on there that means it's fun? There's like an allure I, well, I to a truth that... that is undiscovered, you know? Well, yeah, there the is truth. that. But I also think that we, our world is built around stories, right? That's how yeah. we understand everything. We understand things not as as they are. We understand things as stories sort of imitating how they are. And mm -hmm. when you have a story that is larger than life, it can make you feel like you're living in a more interesting world. Yeah. yeah. So a good story. I, I don't know. I think, I think a good story, um, you know, we've always, we've always loved good stories. We've always, always loved good stories. And I guess that's just because we, stories are how we understand the world. So a good story makes you feel like you're living in a better world. I, I think it's we also get confused between when something's a good story a little bit of us goes, well, if it's a good story, if it follows some whatever underlying structure it is that makes a story a good story, for example, you have like the three-act hero structure, um, like the hero's journey in, in storytelling. The, the mistake we make is that if it sort of, I guess, rhymes with some internalized idea we hold of what is a good story, we then make the mistake that, well, then it must be true. Um, or we hold on to the possibility that it must be true. And, and similarly, we also go, well, the Loch Ness Monster story has been around for so long. It must be like, it must be true because it wouldn't have survived for so long. And those, that, those are sort of psychological quirks that are, I think science is starting to help us um, see through. But for many, many years, that before we had science to test stuff, that, that kind of worked on people, didn't it? It's kind of like, just like, well-crafted bullshit. Mm. Do you reckon, yeah. do you think people might make the mistake and they might wrongfully assume that if it wasn't real, we would have been able to prove it? But of course we can't. But people might assume that you can. I think you're spot on there. I think, yeah. um, I, you see this a lot with Christians saying, well, if God isn't real, then how have you not managed to prove it? And it's like, well, hold on, hold on there, chap. I think you're the one that's got to prove this one, given that, it, <laughs> you know, you're the one that's saying this, 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 this thing is happening that no one can see or whatever. I feel like you've got to prove it. Um, you, the burden of proof is on you. Uh, yeah. So I think people, I think people misunderstand how proving things works. Oh, hundred percent. Um, sort of intuitively. And that makes sense. I mean, I think we all do that. And on, on Lu what Luke was saying, I think, well, Bias is something that is ex that exists in people still. Confirmation bias, you know, you know, uh, it, it is something. The, the thing is, people are inclined to believe what they already believe. You're not going to go looking <laughs> for information yeah. that um, disproves your own belief, and that's something that I really have to like struggle with when I'm making um, episodes where I've found a narrative and I'm like, this is a good story. Now I need to find out if, it, out if it's true, and that is a really difficult thing to do if I've already got a good story in my head. Because I can yeah. have a great, there have been times where I've had great stories and I'm like, okay, now, now I need to look at, to see if this is true. And I need to make sure that I'm searching from the perspective of someone that does not believe that it's true so that I can get the right information. Because if I'm searching from the perspective of someone that believes it's true, that's trying to sort of disprove it, I'm going to find diff different information than if I'm searching from the perspective of someone who doesn't believe it's true and is mm -hmm. trying to disprove it. Because those are two I, I very different that, things. I find that a lot when I'm recording, when I'm editing the live clips, um, and I have to go and evidence some of the things we've said. Is I go and I go and find like search for something that one of us has claimed to be true, and then I find something that says that's not true, and I'm like, God damn it! I need to find something that says it is true, and then I'm like, No, look, that's not how this works. Yeah, exactly. So I just cut it out. I but just cut it out. <laughs> it's so easy to find. It's so easy to find information that confirms your beliefs, right? Like it's so easy yeah. to find that. That's what there's so many common misconceptions, and I'm guilty of it too. Like this, this hap like you can't be, you can't know everything. So this happens a lot on the, you know, on episodes or on lives. I'll say something that 
I probably learned in primary school, that I learned in high school, that I remember a teacher told me, that I remember someone told me, and then someone in the comments will be like, oh, this isn't true. And I'm like, well, gosh darn Whoops. it. Great. But <laughs> when I go and search to see if it, whether it is true or not, there is a lot of there are a lot of people who are under the impression that it is true, and you've got to then find the sort of factual evidence behind it. It is really, really difficult to do that. It's really difficult. And the fact that we're not trained to do it in, in school is understandable because that's not what school is for. School is for setting you up to be a good little worker, but it would it would make the society like you know, that kind of liter like media literacy and ability to discern what information is sort of um correct and what is not and mm. um training people to be more adept at finding information that lies outside of their bias, I think would genuinely make the world a far better place. That's one of the really exciting changes we're hopefully seeing in education over the next few decades is moving away from a model of teaching information because we literally have information in our pockets all the time and moving towards teaching ways of thinking and how to learn and how to question and how like because because mm. like so many of the problems we're seeing in our world is there's loads of evidence to suggest loads of stuff we're doing is rubbish and loads of the things we're doing is based on untruths and we have such large inertia um that we just can't overcome it despite the fact we've got plenty of evidence so being able to set people up where because right now like a load like all, you know you've got a lot of information in your brain from school, one that you don't need, but obviously the rationale behind that is like, but it's 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 creating like a framework for your brain mm. uh, as opposed to the specific information it's mm -hmm. creating like a, a framework and also teaching you to learn, of course. But imagine if the framework of your brain was based on like our best understanding of the world um, and how it works um, fundamentally as opposed to, you know, just a bunch of biographical information about, kings in the 16th century mm. not that that's not interesting and not that it's like to many people that is perfectly interesting but i think probably teaching people how to like not become fascists accidentally is probably more important <laughs> maybe, maybe. honestly i find that really i find that really interesting because like this is the thing i i very much am of the belief that you need to and this doesn't work for everyone right but it's something that i feel like i need to do in order for me to disagree with people because i disagree with people publicly online a lot. That is kind of what I do. I need to understand their arguments so that I can argue against them, right? Yeah. If on like my other channels, I'm laughing at something a conservative has said, if I'm saying, hey, Ben Shapiro is a big dummy, like I need to understand what Ben Shapiro is saying so that I can say, yeah. hey, what Ben Shapiro is saying is ridiculous and you shouldn't listen to it. Yeah. And I find yeah. that so many people that not just follow Ben Shapiro, a lot of people that follow me as well, don't get to understand the opposing side's argument. And that, like, I have bought Jordan Peterson's book because I've been told Jordan Peterson is a, basically a gateway drug to fascism for a lot of young men. And I'm like, okay, interesting. Let's see why that is. Because I need, I feel personally like I need to know, but I don't think that's something that is present in a lot of people. I feel like a lot of people will take the side of the people that they think sound better and you yeah. know sometimes that can be sometimes that you could get lucky yeah. and that could be for like I'll take what feels right or good then. yeah but it's just it's it is baffling to me how little um people that try and sort of refute me online understand my arguments it is honestly baffling it's yeah. it really is it's like they you you don't listen you just disagree it's it is just interesting that um I feel like the world that we're in is very much not set up to people for people sort of looking to gain information or looking to sort of disprove what they believe. It's basically just taking what you taking whatever comes to you, yeah. essentially confirming your biases. Like you're looking for uh, information to confirm your worldview as opposed to information to test your worldview. Exactly. Look at the anti-vax movement. We've done an episode on this, right? We've done the anti-vax or anti-fax episode. Jamp, what number was that? Oh, that was early. Um, is that in the twenties? I can't remember that one actually. I think it was twenties. Oh, sure. My first failure. Jim. My first oh. failure. I think it was in the twenties, so, like mid twenties ish. Cool. Let's 20, say twenty five. Twenty six. No, twenty five is a little bit. Okay, watch every episode up to episode twenty five until you get to. It was episode twenty nine. Watch every episode up to episode twenty nine. There you go, and beyond that. <laughs> and yeah, watch this one too. No, so. That's the thing. The anti-vax or anti-vax episode. We went over that. There is, it is indisputable 
that vaccines are safe, right? As a general rule, vaccines are safe. Not every single vaccine is going to be 100% safe. Um, right off the bat, there could be some issues and those get worked out. But like across the board, vaccines are a safe thing. You shouldn't be incredibly hesitant towards vaccines. We also know that vaccines don't cause autism. And yet that myth is perpetuated. And it's not perpetuated amongst the majority of um, doctors and scientists. It's perpetuated across Karens and Jessicas and, and Jennifers in in Facebook groups. Yeah, It's people going up. It's not people releasing studies. It's people doing talks on this. And that's what baffled me when I found out about, when I you know did that episode, when I looked into it, that the information that was there to support those claims was flimsy as all hell. You know, I and that's again. This comes up. I wanted to fully understand their side. I wanted to look at the strongest arguments that were being made. I wanted to find the people that were using evidence and convincing others, and I could not find that. The most I could find were like forum posts and some videos of talks. I had a friend from school whose mum was an anti-vaxxer, <laughs> oh, no. and I I messaged him because I'm still good friends with him, and I said, "Hey, man." Um, where does where do you get it? Where does this come from? And he said to me that, yeah, well, honestly, mostly what you see is them doing keynote speeches. You know, you can get those videos oh, on God, YouTube. Yeah. And it's just, it is baffling to me that like people don't do, people don't look into that sort of stuff. They don't look into to see what the people that disagree with them say. And I feel like that is how a lot of people get drawn into the anti-vax movement because they're, they're they don't, they don't have the sort of, they don't look into it beforehand and they're drawn in by yep. all of the strong arguments made on, on bloody Facebook groups and stuff, you know? It, it, we, I feel like we live in a world where people believe what they want to believe and because information is so accessible, it is very easy to find information that confirms what you want to hear yep. and what you want to believe. Um, and yeah, like, like, like you were saying, we, I feel like education needs to pivot to being less about memorize these facts and more about here's how to discern truth and reality yeah. from lies and propaganda. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's so, so many psychological quirks that, that are left in us for, they're probably good at some point, but mm. now that we're living as a community of 7 billion, probably 8 billion people, um, it's not, it's not, very, they're not very good. We're still yeah. designed to live in like a jungle. <laughs> it's, it's, it's horrifying. It's like, it's the sort of snake reflex as well. You know the snake reflex? No, that whole the thing. No. I don't think it's specifically called the snake reflex, but this is something. And again, I want to put a caveat on this. Some of these details might be wrong. I'm kind of half remembering this, I think, from a PBS Eons thing or from somewhere. Right? You know, so take this all with a grain of salt. But I do remember sort of reading or hearing somewhere that um, we have quite deeply ingrained in us, a lot of mammals have deeply ingrained in them, um, this sort of fear or um, sort of this response to to something that looks like a snake because obviously snakes are very good hunters <laughs> oh, and so like cats with cucumbers yeah cats like cats with cucumbers yeah. and so like if you see something that looks like a snake you're like ah even if you've <laughs> never seen a snake in your life right and it's just right. this this automatic response that still happens despite the fact that honestly who is that useful to <laughs> <laughs> well especially in in Britain, it's not particularly useful here. Oh God, an adder! Oh, oh wait, never mind. It's <laughs> <laughs> a grass snake. <laughs> <laughs> like, whoops. Uh, wait, is it adders in the UK? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. boy, they do love their maths here. No, but that's the thing. There are really, there are really deeply ingrained things in us that just are kind of at this point kind of useless. But also, I not to be a little, not to be conspiracy theory here, not to be sounding like you know crazy. Oh God. I am. Oh dear. I don't Famous think. Last words. Well, I don't think that. Um, I don't necessarily think it's in the best interest of the UK government to pivot education to being more like what we're saying, right? It, it doesn't seem to be because to me right now, the UK government is. I'm not saying they're they're falling to fascism, but there are a lot of things that are n n no bueno that have been, that are being done by the UK government and. Being able to get away with those things, a very easy way to do a lot of this is to keep your population uneducated about certain things. If you don't teach them about alternatives to capitalism, for example, your population is not going to be able to make any comments about the system that is exploiting them. If you sort of don't teach them about the wrongs of Winston Churchill um, or the 
the the the issues that the, of the UK and colonialism, then you stop them from being able to criticize their country as being, you know, like sort of um, violent. And it to me, it really seems as though it like. I, I can't imagine the current UK government really pushing for education to be pivoted to the way that we've they spoke about in terms of discerning in, like information and reality from propaganda because they rely on propaganda to an extent, right? At, at this point. And they rely on people being ignorant about the past. They rely on like, you know, if you don't, if you want to implement a law wherein protesting a statue can get you 10 years in prison, you probably don't want your population thinking, hey, maybe that guy shouldn't have a statue in the first place. Right? Like, it's it's just, I really hope we get to that point when with education. But to me, it doesn't seem like it's in the best interest of of our current government current to do times. that. Yeah, and it's not just our government. It's many governments across the world. I mean, like, you know, look at the, the America, US instilling, yeah. instilling like, um, nationalism in children from the age of five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm not I, I mean i think they instill nationalism in us just not quite so overtly yeah oh we absolutely oh we no, we do have nationalism i'm i'm saying that we get national nationalism instilled in us as well i'm just saying it's not just us america do it too there's i mean yeah. plenty of other countries that do that also it's just france i think quite good at, oh quite good at that god yeah france has been pushing like this is what's baffling to me i've had americans say to me um oh you live in a socialist country all of Europe is socialist. And I'm like, compared to, yeah. France had a NHS, bloody burqa so ban. A... Has a burqa ban. <laughs> right? Like, that's not socialist. It, it truly is not. Um, shall we get back to the Loch Ness Monster? Oh, oh yeah, that's where yeah. we started. I, yeah. I reckon um, Nessie's a socialist. She is socialist, <laughs> right? She's She definitely is. She doesn't socialize, she so but she is socialist. <laughs> <laughs> Like worst case, she's a what is she's <laughs> she's a libertarian, you know. <laughs> she she's an ANCAP. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, don't Ugh. don't don't do that. No. Um. So Nessie, right? This whole story, um, Gamble basically uh, used it as publicity to sort of promote eDNA, which is fantastic, I think. So I've actually got some I've got some tweets from me from him here. Uh. <laughs> And this is amazing. I, 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 I kind of love this. That we run a science podcast here. Yeah. You know, we get to look at the history of science. We get to see scientists from hundreds of years ago and how they operated, uh, you know, when they were basically just rich people that used their money in that way. Uh, and nowadays, running this science podcast, I don't need to, you know, do what they had to do ages ago and learn how to read Latin to understand all these books. I can go on to twitter.com, type in Neil Gemmel and find a tweet <laughs> thread that explains what was going on here which i absolutely love which ends in a moana gif like that is that is a, <laughs> it is amazing what world are we living in i know i love I, I love this world it's great so this is the, this is the tweet thread it's just it's <laughs> it's only three tweets long it's very short so he said i get the odd message that queries the value of the Loch Ness work, with particular concern emerging about the use of taxpayer funding for an endeavor they see as frivolous fair enough we all want our tax dollars put to good use so just FYI, I'm paid through an empowered chair. The work was mostly funded by industry, industry support and people donating their time and resources. We did a million plus dollar project for 10,000s. The science is basic fundamental work that will have international resonance. It has been hard work, but was most definitely fun and it addressed a real science issue, generated publicity and advertising revenue for New Zealand and Otago worth many millions. Plus it introduced eDNA to the world and switched on a new generation to science. So in short... You're welcome. The gift from the world. <laughs> Can I say? <laughs> Except you're welcome. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. I, I genuinely, I, I was so excited uh, when I got to researching this story, when I found out that this was what was going on. I had a little bit of disappointment where I was like, oh, there is really nothing here. It's just a frivolous little study. And then I was like, oh, oh, hold on. Wait, no, this is a bit more interesting than that. And I found, I, you know, you did some digging. I found his tweets and everything. It's just fantastic. So I'll just briefly go through what eDNA is. So, you know, I've, I've kind of gone through it already, but I'll just touch on it really quickly again uh, before we finish. So, you know, usually as you go around your life, you leave you leave DNA about. I've said, like, you know, your skin coming off, but also um, eggs, sperm, feces, all that stuff. Um, that's got your DNA in it. And we can basically take little bits of DNA in the same way that we do it um, in, the same way that we do it in, what's it called? 
um, when we at uh, crime scene stuff, uh, CSI. Oh, forensics. Uh, forensics, yeah. In the same way that we do with forensics, uh, we take little bits of DNA and we can amplify it up and we can study that to see what it is. And we've got lots of different profiles of different animals' DNA. So we can be like, ah, oh, this is the DNA of an eel, this is the DNA of a rabbit, and and so forth. And the the database, the, the reference database that we've got, so the, the database of sort of um, genomes for different animals, that has been increasing um, hugely because DNA sequencing has gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. And you can get more, you can get more DNA out of very, very little, very easily. And this is all really cool stuff. And I studied this, this at uni. I find it incredibly fascinating. This is a revolution that most people don't know about, right? Most people probably aren't aware of these bounds and leaps and bounds that are being made in DNA research, but it is absolutely fantastic. We're building up massive, massive libraries of DNA of, of everything that we can, right? We're taking different animals and building up um, libraries of their genomes. So now we're basically getting to a point where, you know, we can use this sort of eDNA, DNA that is just left in an environment to figure out what is living there. And it is it is fantastic. Um, so the U.S. National Institutes of Health um, has a DNA uh, sort of a DNA uh, database, um, and it's doubled every eighteen months since nineteen eighty two. Um, it has more than two hundred sixty trillion base pairs of DNA across more than two hundred million sequences. It's incredible. Um, and is that stored that stored digitally, is it, or is that? samples of dna actual physical samples that'll be stored that'll be super stored yeah. Di digitally yeah that's i'm not laughing at you i'm i'm picturing like if they were to try and store it sort of physically that would degrade so dna is yeah. is a good molecule in people's bodies but that stuff degrades so fast no like you can keep that digitally and it's literally we've, we've been over this it's so easy to keep it digitally because it's such a simple code it's a c g and t it's yeah. you can literally I gotta go, I gotta go. <laughs> you can literally store that in a, in a in a plain text file if you wanted to yeah it is fantastic it, you could do it in an excel file it's it's so cool i just i love this so much i just get so excited about this kind of uh this kind of stuff um and it's and again this sort of eDNA stuff it's basically taking soil samples water samples and being able to get a get a sort of picture of what is living there Instead of having to, you know, do surveys, there's this whole idea where you put down different squares and you see what's in the square, or you take sam you take the sort of uh, take uh, organisms back to the lab. In this case, you just take a sample, you take it back to the lab, and you yeah. study that. Wow, it's incredible. Um, people are making a lot of discoveries from it. It's kind of exploded since 2011, um, and it's and right now um, the National Geographic Society is trying to extract DNA from a soil sample um, from the South Pacific island of Niku Maroro to see if um, a gravesite that is there is that of Amelia Earhart, the woman who uh, was lost when she was sort of flying across, I think, the, the yeah. Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Wow. So that is the story of Nessie and eDNA and, you know, the potential eel that could be the Loch Ness monster. Very good. So that is that. I mean, we've maybe got a little little quick fire quiz for you. <gasps> dun, dun, oh, dun, dun, dun. I got this. Loch Ness yeah. edition. <laughs> so the rules are the same as always. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. I will ask one question, one question between the two of you. I have to finish asking the question before you can buzz in with your answers. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer wins. What do they win, champ? Nothing. Gosh darn right. Luke, what is your buzzer? Flippy, flappy, floppy, floppy. Very Sound good of buzzer. A big eel. Mm. <laughs> Jamp, what is your buzzer? Boop, 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 boop. Which is the bubbles coming Very up. Good. <laughs> from the eel? Yeah, from the eel. Fantastic. The eels breathe air. May I assume they do. Yeah. yeah. Wait. <laughs> no, wait, they won't. No, they're, eels they're... won't breathe air, Jamp. They're water creatures. No, but they won't have bubbles. bubbles. No, Nessie breathes bubbles. Uh, Nessie breathes bubbles. Okay. Even though she's most likely an eel. <laughs> yeah. My question for you today is that fake picture of Nessie in the 30s, what was it actually? <laughs> floppy, 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 floppy. Jamp, I think that was you. I, th I believe it was a toy submarine and some putty of some kind. Ding, ding, ding. That is correct. Yes. Well done. Wow. Well done. It was not the Loch Ness monster. It was a no. toy submarine and some wood putty. Thank you. Well, wood putty, that was it. Yeah, wood party. I think that's it from us. Anything you guys want to add to this? We had a bit of a big discussion in here today, didn't we? Well, I'd just like to ask, Jamp, could you uh, could you say the name of the monster, please? Loch Ness Monster. 
No. Nessie. No. Loch Ness. Loch. Loch Ness. Is that Loch. <laughs> Loch. Loch. <laughs> My mum used to drill into me. It's Loch. Loch. Not Loch. Loch. I just, I resigned myself before we did this. I don't know if you noticed. I feel like I've gone more Scottish with this one, but. Yeah. You said no, you I definitely a few were times, Scottish. which you don't often say. I. I well, I resigned myself to the fact that I'm going to have people correcting me on the pronunciation. I was born and raised in Scotland. I can say it however I like, to be honest. Well. When they say that, we can just time code them to this time code where we talk about that exact thing. Very good. I grew up in Australia where we called it the Loch Ness Monster. Loch Ness Monster. Loch Ness Monster. Loch Ness Monster. Uh, in the water. Loch Ness Monster. Down in the water, in the Loch Ness. Yeah, it's in a place called Loch Ness. <laughs> <laughs> in Scotland. Yeah, in Scotland. Monster in the water. Yeah. There's no bloody dingoes out there. You won't find any. <laughs> I reckon it's just a dingo that's it's, got lost. It's just a dingo. Isn't it? it's a, a dingo's tail. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be Fantastic. It. Well, I think that's it for us today. Nothing else that we can add. Thank you very much for watching this episode. We would like to thank all of our patrons with a very special thank you to our executive producers, Ashley Muller and Finn TZ. And also, thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday and why not leave us a nice wee review or a comment too. You can support us at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys or find and contact us at SciGuysPod on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and at SciGuys on TikTok too. Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod at gmail.com. You can follow me at NotCore everywhere. You can follow me at Jamkin everywhere. You can follow me at LukeCutforth everywhere. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.